The amazing thing about Komombo is that in one moment, it brought together the vision and the mission statement of the Worldwide Indigenous Science Organization's beginnings, and it demonstrated the power of bringing Indigenous science and Western science together. My life and the mission of the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network is to bring the two ways of knowing together to create an interface so that the communication that happened has integrity and that life on this planet heals and flourishes. Archaeoacoustics refers to the sounds created in relation to archaeological sites. Sometimes they're naturally occurring and sometimes they were created by ancient people. And they were created to impart or to substantiate the message of the site itself. Archaeoacoustics as a field was established at Cambridge in the year 2003. We have been a part of the archaeoacoustics research for several years now. What happened at Komombo was a breakthrough in the field. The ancient Egyptians, in terms of their interest in acoustics and their um, deep, deep interest in symbolism, the symbolic ceremony, I, I can completely resonate with your uh, concept. In December of 2019, we organized a trip to the Nile River for American Indian and other cultural shamans. The difficulty with doing things from what I call an indigenous science perspective is that unlike Western perspectives, you cannot say, I'm going there and I'm going to do this and this will be what the results will be or not, depending if they're reliable, valid and rigorous. What we have to do in an indigenous science way is be able to receive a vision, understand the responsibility of it, and then fulfill it. And in that moment, we will discover why we were doing it. The value of it is, from a psychological Jungian Western point of view, is that we get our ego out of the way. When we do so, what we have is a moment of pure research, of pure science and the things that we discover from this point of view can be linked with Western science and its materialistic observation of phenomena. The Egyptians were certainly very big into symbolism. You know, I've got so much evidence uh, to support that notion. And also I have a lot of evidence to support the notion that they were focused on acoustics. They actually had significant knowledge. I mean, not in, a, not in the kind of technical sense that we have today, but they were certainly extremely interested in acoustics. They um, created many spaces specifically, in my view, uh, for the acoustic effect. We sailed from Luxor up to Aswan we reached Komombo, an ancient Egyptian temple in a little bulge in the Nile. The temple of Komombo is very unique. It's unique because it's the only temple that's actually two temples, two rectangles, one inscribed by the other. One temple is dedicated to Sobek, the crocodile god, and the other to Horus, the falcon, god of the skies. The story goes that in ancient days, Sobek and Horus and their people lived together peacefully. It was a land of plenty, with grain growing and food for all and a good life for all. Sobek, as a crocodile reptile, symbolizes our physical self, our unconscious self, the dark, deep, primordial waters of mind and life. And Horus, the falcon, represents consciousness, illumination, the sky, rational thought. For some reason, Sobek decides at some point that he really has had it with Horus and his people. 
and tells them they have to leave. And the falcon, being a noble sort of bird, says, okay, and leaves. When Horus left, he took with him all the farmers and the workers. And the crocodile got so back, stayed all by himself and with his people. When they started to cultivate the land, instead of having crops, they started to have gold. They could not eat the gold. So they had to bring back Horus and his people to cultivate the land. So Sobek goes and sees Horus and makes amends, and Horus says, okay, and returns. And then life renews again. And both gods were worshipped here. But they had to build this temple. It's a dual temple for both Horus and the crocodile gets her back. That's the mythology. And it's an original mythology about the site. And we are fortunate scientifically, both from an indigenous and Western perspective, that that oral history, that mythology exists. We are also fortunate because so much of the temple still exists. What is known about the temple is architecturally, in addition to the two rectangles, there is a tunnel that runs beneath the ground and then opening to what was a throne in the interior rectangle temple. Archaeologists today speculate that Egyptian priests got themselves ready in the room, the, the room exterior to the temple walls. One of our shamans, Ernesto Olmos, who is Mexica from Mexico, a jaguar shaman, became very excited because it reminded him of a similar crocodile temple that he worships at in Mexico. I've been working with Worldwide Indigenous Science Network from almost seven years. I'm from Oaxaca, Mexico. Part of my family is a traditional curanderos and a spiritual people. My father brought me in a very young age to Monte Alban. Monte Alban is a sacred site. It's the mountain of the Jaguar. My childhood, I have experiences all around the site. One of them was with sound. The phenomenon of sound in Monte Alban is amazing. In some corners of some buildings, you can hear people from maybe around uh, almost a mile, very, like very close to your ears. And this phenomenon uh, has been recorded in my brain for a long time. And he pulled me aside and said excitedly, did you notice, Apila, that in the interior temple, the sound is more chaotic? But when you go to the corridor between the two, the sounds change. Where the sound changes is immediately above the tunnel that goes beneath the two walls of the temple. And above that tunnel are some hieroglyphs and Ba's relief. What is shown to ears, two eyes of Horus, and above it, Ma'at, the goddess with one feather above her. What does that mean? It means look and listen at this place. Amr, our Egyptologist partner, demonstrated a strange archaeoacoustic property within the corridor. He clapped his hands, and when he did, the sound hit one wall, ricocheted to the second, and dissolved in the third. And where this phenomena happens is immediately before the Ba's relief of the ears and the eyes and Ma'at. I've been working as a tour leader guide for the last 25 years. Well, last year, I was honored to be with the Wizen group during their visit to Egypt. The highlight of the uh, uh, whole tour was by far the temple of Komambu. The temple of Komambu, which was built in the Greek-Roman times, and it's a temple that was dedicated 
to the falcon god Horus and the crocodile god, god Sobek. Well, the temple was built in a way that you can hear and experience different things from other temples. See the echo? The acoustics that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. It's very clear. In the corridor, you're gonna see ears on the walls and eyes. They want you to look and to listen. This is what they want. And then the echo of the voice on the walls of the temple actually reflects three times. So when you say something, it goes like one, two, and then three. So it mainly means Horus and Sobek, and then both of them together. That's the echo you hear during the visit of the temple, which makes it unique. Amr clapped his hands. One, two, three. The sound ends. It's not ragged, it's pure. In that moment, we realized that we are being shown something that no one has seen there. By thinking from both a Western way and an indigenous science way, we could see how the architecture and the archaeoacoustics and the hieroglyphs, the symbols of the place, all supported by the mythology, demonstrate the truth of the Horus and the Sobek reality. When Ernesto realized the properties of sound coming together at Kumombo and heard about the tunnel beneath our feet, he became very excited and he said, I know what this is. The outer room is where the priest, priestesses, Pharaoh, the officiant of the ceremony would prepare themselves spiritually, psychologically, and probably in attire. We discover a uh, sacred hiding rooms. Um, one of the guides and one of the guys who uh, was there in the place, they tell us about the priest coming in from this room and go under and go up after um, looks like a walk like a, the alligator, the scar between the two temples. The reason the tunnel is so small is that in order to come through it, you must crawl, you must become the crocodile. You crawl your way to the opening of the throne and there above the throne is a skylight where maybe in ancient times an actual falcon would come through. Later by doing a search with another teachers about the sacred site is exactly what I thought the alligator in us culture too is the primogenous energy. Uh, the alligators come out from the waters and be in on the earth. It's similar, very similar to what they was doing in that temples. It was very similar about the unconsciousness coming up and look for consciousness. And the consciousness represented by the wind and light. And we found another images at the museum with the body of alligator and the head of Horus. Um, when I start searching more, I discover is the symbol of Sobek, is the, the symbol of ignorance, is the harder, the material, represent the material, the most density of material but with the act of coming out from the waters of unconsciousness, coming to consciousness, to be consciousness. And that's represented by the Horus. The Horus is the falcon. Horus the falcon represents the spiritual from the material, the heavy, and the symbol of the crocodile go on to light to the spirit of Horus. Those
this is a place where actually a lot of initiations happen that's what i've been discovered very similar to mexico when we have sites where you can grow first uh, getting out from your where you are afraid afraid to lose afraid to confront afraid to leave and go to the higher dimensions of be ones with a great consciousness that everything is made for a reason the suggestion is that all levels of the temple sight sound design appearance even written in hieroglyphs impart the same message humanity and life cannot survive unless we bring all aspects of ourselves together head and emotions and contextualize it within reality that is the only way forward and this temple demonstrates it above the two ears and the two eyes telling us to be conscious in this moment is Ma'at and Ma'at is a goddess she has one feather on her head and what she represents is truth this is the truth that the ancients left for us today in a time of pandemic and a time of economic collapse we too have entered the primordial waters of Sobek and like Sobek we need to bring our minds connected with our hearts so that our hubris our pathology of normative dissociation can be healed that once again we can become a part of the whole of life and make our financial and our scientists and scientific thought and research be consonant with creation, with all of my relations, as we say in our indigenous science. Why? Because when you're a part of it, when we're a part of the whole, which is the power of indigenous wisdom, when you're a part of it, you can see how things are related. So the long term looks very different. It's a long term of life. It's a long term of sustainability. The cupboard of Western science is bare. It does not know how to lead us out of this chaos that we are into. But this ancient temple of Komombo was left by the ancestors so long ago and offers a doorway to renewal and to life.